Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Brever and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today, we have a big show for you all. We are going to be going through all of our award picks, our all-NBA picks, our all-defense picks, and our all-rookie picks. So, we're going to try not to beat any dead horses and keep things moving because some of these conversations we have had before, such as... MVP Logan and I don't imagine that your mind has changed but who is your MVP it's Nikola Jokic uh the nerds love Nikola Jokic man they love some Nikola Jokic the distinction I would make is uh, a point you made a couple weeks ago Carson uh when you were arguing about the valuable uh how valuable Jokic's skill set is compared to Luka's and especially the fact that here's what I'd say the Mavericks as a team did not become a great team until the back half of the season when they got a great defender uh, in Daniel Gafford and P.J. Washington. And, you know, Jokic has consistently let out great teams really regardless of his supporting cast with the Fakus of the world, with the Austin Rivers, with the Monte Morrises, right? Luka was doing incredible stuff last year, and the Mavericks didn't make the playoffs. And I just think Jokic leads to easier, more seamless uh, winning offense, he can do it off ball, he can do it on ball, he's more efficient. But really, I, I think Jokic just maximizes the players around him more. And this is not a shot at Luka Doncic. I think Luka Doncic would have an MVP case in about every other year. I also want to give credence to Giannis Antetokounmpo. If you take any three of these guys, mm-hmm. I have no problem. I think all of them are deserving MVP candidates. I think they all make really good cases uh for winning this award but i think Jokic has the most valuable skill set in the league and i just think he maximizes the skill sets of his teammates more than any other player uh in the league and he's the most unstoppable playmaker i think he's the most unstoppable scorer and uh contrary to popular belief i think Jokic is a impactful defender he's not a great defender but he's impactful and he's good enough uh Jokic has been my MVP um, basically since Joel Embiid went down with his injury, and uh, I have not wavered. Uh, and at the end of the season, he is still my MVP. I can't really overstate how much this is not an anti luca thing because it's really annoying when people perceive it that way. I think Luka is on the trajectory to be one of, if not the greatest offensive players ever. Like, I think there are still some little things that he has to figure out to max out his peak value. When you are talking about like an offensive goat ceiling, but just how incredibly productive and great he's been up to this point in his career is a complete historical outlier. I do think Jokic is, as of now though, at the highest offensive peak that we've ever seen. He's just solved offense. He's optimized offense. And You see it in that Timberwolves game, right? It doesn't matter if they try Nas Reed on him with Gobert, the best defender alive, a lot of people will tell you, or at least the best regular season defender alive in the Roma role. It doesn't matter if they have Gobert on him in single coverage. He is going to score with overwhelming efficiency because of his physical advantages and absurd touch shot making, and he is going to make perfect decision after perfect decision after perfect decision. Luka will get you a good shot every time down the floor with just his sheer on-ball force, his physicality, his shot making, his playmaking. Jokic, because of his unselfishness, his versatility, because of the fact that he is seven feet tall and can make these touch shots from anywhere in the paint at a 65% clip, is going to get you a great shot every time down the floor. And I do think we've seen that he has a more sizable impact on team success than Luka. Because of the efficiency, the off-ball impact, the overall offensive versatility, and the unstoppability as a scorer. If you think Luke is the best scorer alive, I'm totally fine with that. But I saw this discourse restart the other day, and people think it's crazy to say Jokic is the best scorer alive. But to me, it's really not. Because it's not about regular season volume. Volume absolutely matters. And Jokic turns up the volume in the playoffs and maintains elite efficiency. To me, it's about how impossible is that guy to stop. And I just think Jokic is the most impossible scorer to stop because get him the ball in the paint, and that is a layup efficiency shot for him on top of the perimeter skill that he obviously does have to complement that. But the Nuggets are 20 points per 100 possessions better with Jokic on the floor than off it. He is the only guy to hit that mark in consecutive seasons since Kevin Garnett 20 years ago, and they are a plus 12 
net team with him on the floor. And the really ridiculous counter that I've seen to this lately is that Jokic's on off numbers are juiced and the Nuggets have deliberately tanked their centers over the years to juice his on off numbers. And it's only because they play the starting five so consistently together. And it is true that the Nuggets starting five is a great cohesive unit and they play a lot of minutes together. But the reason that conversation is silly to me is look at any combination of the Nuggets key offensive players on with Jokic off and then look at what he does without any combination of those key offensive players. Like if you have Jamal Murray and Aaron Gordon on the floor, but no Jokic, the Nuggets have a 102 offensive rating. If you have Jokic out there without Jamal and AG, both of them off, they have a 121 offensive rating, 19 point swing. If you have Jamal and MPJ, but no Jokic, they produce an offensive rating of 102. If you have Jokic, but no Jamal or MPJ, you have a 123 offensive rating. If you have none of those guys on the floor alongside him and just Jokic, so he doesn't have a second, third, or fourth best offensive players, he produces an offensive rating of 120. It's just like, guys, I think we can appreciate the value that these real quality basketball players bring as play finishers in the case of AG and MPJ and as a perimeter shot maker in the case of Jamal Murray, but to give them a disproportionate amount of credit when it is so clear that whoever you put out there with Jokic, you're going to have an elite offense. As you mentioned, we saw it in 2021, in 2022 with these decimated supporting casts. It's just silly to me. And we're still seeing the, hey, Jokic fans, did you guys know that his VORP and BPM don't matter? Maybe I just follow the right people. I haven't seen somebody mention Jokic's VORP in so long. You don't need to single number metrics suck this dude is just the best basketball player on the planet watch him play watch how he leaves defenses just completely helpless night after night he makes everything go he plays perfect offense i do think he is the more impactful defender and when it comes to that irreplaceable element offensively and therefore having the most dramatic impact if you still have Kyrie on the floor without Luka, you have a really good star on-ball creator from the perimeter out of pick and roll and isolation, and he can replace a good chunk of that value. And that is why the Maz offensive rating has been as good with Kyrie on and Luka off as vice versa, or as it has been with both Luka and Kyrie on. That is not to take away from Luka, who is amazing, but it's just the reality that it is easier to supplement his value than it is Jokic's, who the offense is going to completely crumble without. So I'm sticking Jokic. Props to Luka. Amazing season. And this team sitting at 50 wins is super impressive. And I think they are the biggest threat to Denver in the West in these playoffs. But it's not just about points plus assists, man. It is about the offensive mastery of the game, the efficiency, the ability to elevate teammates and play without the ball. And Jokic is just unrivaled there. Okay, rookie of the year. There's literally no debate here. It's Wemby. I don't know if you have anything you want to say about this. Yeah, I mean, I have some, I have some cool numbers. Okay. Uh, just to emphasize, I don't know if it's the case, and Carson, you might have to check me here. You know, we did our all-rookie draft a while back. I took Wemby. I think steal of the draft, personally. Uh, I think Wemby has an argument as maybe the greatest rookie of all time. Now, obviously, no, there... I'm going to tell you right now, there is no argument. But it's just because... Kareem comes into the league at 22 years old. It's a matter of physical maturity and basketball development, but I'm going to have to stop you right there because there are dudes who, when they set foot on the floor, Kareem was probably the best player in basketball, top three. Wilt was a top three player in basketball. Here's what, here's what I would argue. I mean, there's just things that Wemby is capable of that no, like just nobody's ever been like capable of. I mean, that I doesn't think... make him better. If you cannot stop Kareem from scoring and he's an elite defender, like it's amazing that Wemby can shoot step back threes. Doesn't matter compared to just being unstoppable, being a significantly more dominant player. I mean, top five is that egregious? I still think it's a really tough bar to hit, but again, that's just a maturity factor. David Robinson, Tim yeah. Duncan, just comparing him to the Spurs. Like, you're comparing a guy who just turned 20 to yeah. much more grown men. But, That's why I don't think we need to go there. We don't need to go there. In the scope of modern NBA, the high school era to the one-and-done era, he's the two, best we've seen. Since he's the best since Tim since, Duncan. Since 2000, he's the best is, rookie. Absolutely. That being said, I think there's merit that 
we can have a little bit of discourse on there. I mean, like top 10, top whatever. Wemby's one of the greatest rookies ever. And since 2000, I don't think it's a competition. Mm-hmm. Wemby put up 21, 11, and 4 on 47, 32, 80 splits this season, 57% true shooting. One of the greatest rookies ever. He's one of seven rookies ever to post a stat line of 21 points, 10 boards, and three assists per game. Uh, that's Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Larry Bird, Blake Griffin. Shout out the boys, Sidney Wicks, and Victor Wembanyama. Uh, 16th most points per game by a rookie post merger. Tied 12th most rebounds per game by a rookie post merger. Ninth most points, assists, uh, and rebounds per game by a rookie post merger. Third most blocks per game by a rookie post merger. Third most stocks per game, blocks per game plus steals per game by a rookie post merger. And I will emphasize the Spurs were nearly 10 points per 100 possessions better defensively with Wemby on the floor. A difference between a defensive rating of 112.6 and a defensive rating of 122.4. He's got the potential to be the greatest defensive big man of all time. Honestly, I think that's just Wemby's expectations at this point, which is absurd. And he's got the potential to be the greatest shooting big man of all time. It's a staggering difference, Carson. I think he was, I don't have the exact number, I think he was either above or close to 40% on off the dribble or step back Mm -hmm. threes this season. And he was a 28% catch and shooter, which just speaks to, it's going to come. Like, I don't know if it's next year. I don't know if it's two years. I don't know how long the trajectory to him becoming an elite shooter in all phases. He's got the potential to be the greatest shooting big man ever um it's not a competition and it's sad because it has completely wiped away some really good rookie campaigns i mean chet holmgren i think had one Mm -hmm. of the best rookie campaigns since 2000 uh in terms of just straight up rim protection i don't even know i think it's sometimes we can overemphasize chet's slightness and i think in certain matchups it is very costly you know against the go bears of the world the nurkiches the zubatses right But against everybody, like, Chet's still a great rim protector. One of the best rookies we've ever seen. It's like, it's weird, man. It's like a Pokemon evolution. You got Chet Holmgren who came in as this great rim return and this great shooter. And then we just got Wemby. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. the the supersized version of Chet. You got Brandon Miller who had an awesome year this year. Uh, Jaime Jaquez, Kaysan Wallace. Shout out to those boys. Uh, Yeah, Wemby robbed Kaysan Wallace, Rookie of the Year, let's be honest. I'm just saying, because Wemby had such a great rookie campaign, we didn't really, so many, we just never got into the weeds of all the rookies that were playing good basketball. We talked about Mm -hmm. some, you know, Amen Thompson, Asar Thompson, Kaysan, Brandon, Jaime, Chet, like, but... They're completely overshadowed by one of the greatest rookie campaigns ever. This is not a debate. It's Wemby's award, uh, point blank, period. Yeah, it was a debate for a couple months because Chet legitimately has had one of the best rookie seasons of this century. And that is where it really is to me, like Wemby overshadowing this complete unicorn, this absolute freak with the shooting ability, the ball handling, the fluid athleticism. Obviously, this all-time rim protection, the defensive range. And it's like, if you stack Chet up against Paolo, if you stack him up against Scotty, if you stack him up against LaMelo, the recent winners, he had a better rookie season than any of those guys. Like, this sort of impact on a really good team is so rare. He transformed them on both sides of the ball. And then you just have Wemby, where it's like, by the end of the year, this dude is a top 15 player in basketball. He continued to evolve. Since moving to center on December 8th, though, man, so you're looking at a significant majority of the season. 22, 11, and four and a half assists in over five stocks per game on 58% true shooting. Those are Wemby's averages. It's just incomprehensible. And I'll uh, read off some stats of my own. You were comparing him to a lot of the post-merger standards. But if we do move the goalpost just a bit to like this more one-and-done era, since 2000, he is second among all rookies in points per game. He's third in rebounds per game. He averaged the most assists per game by a rookie big since Alvin Adams back in 76. He is second in threes made by a rookie center ever, only two Chet. So shout out to them. Again, the two unicorns together. And he averaged the most blocks and stocks per game by a rookie since Robinson in 1990. It is easily the best rookie season we've seen since Tim Duncan. And he is easily the rookie of the year. But the other award for which he is getting... A whole lot of buzz, Logan, is Defensive Player of the Year. Is he your choice there? 
He's not, but I don't blame people if they want to take Wemby. I mean, I think he already is the best defensive playmaker in the league. You read off the stocks per mm-hmm. game. I mean, it's it's absurd. Uh, Wemby's length is just game breaking, game shattering. The things that he's capable of uh, defensively, we've never seen someone that has this kind of ability to wreck a game defensively. I mean, just because of physical attributes. Uh, he isn't for me. Uh, I- I'm going to give it to Rudy Gobert, and I do think the Timberwolves. How do I put this? Like, I think the Timberwolves would have a good defensive floor. I think they'd be a good defensive team with the guys they have at the point of attack. McDaniels, Edwards, uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Carl Anthony Towns. Like, they've got really good length. And so I think the Timberwolves were destined to be a good defense with their personnel. But what Rudy Gobert can do to transform and take you up another level is just different. Now, maybe people would argue, you know, you put Wemby in that situation, maybe he thrives the exact same way. Maybe the Timberwolves were just as dominant or more dominant of a defense. I don't know. What I do know is that Gobert was there, Gobert anchored it, and Gobert is a such a physical difference maker. And that's where I will hold it a little bit against Wemby right now. Um, Gobert is not prone to getting big-bodied by these strong, physical centers. Um, and the Timberwolves just had a better team defense when Gobert was on the floor than when Wemby was on the floor. And I read off the number. The Spurs were staggering 10 points, uh, you know, for 100 possessions better defensively. Uh, they had a defensive rating of 112.6 with Wemby on the floor. That's really great. That's mm-hmm. really good. The Timberwolves had a defensive rating of 107.6 with Rudy Gobert on the I mean, that's almost incomprehensible in the modern NBA with how dominant uh, offenses are and how how skilled everybody on the floor is. And, you know, you've been uh, reciting this stat, Carson, about the, uh, you know, how unprecedentedly dominant the Timberwolves' defense has been in comparison. And that's uh, kind of the nail in the coffin for Wemby's case and why I would side with Gobert. Like, the Timberwolves' defense has been historically great in a different way. Um, And I know Wemby said this, and I think he said this after you said it um, Mm. on our show, that, you know, Gobert's going to take it this year, but this is probably Wemby's award to lose for the next decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I agree with that, you know, and if the Timberwolves defense is this dominant next year too, maybe Gobert is a case, but I just think a full off season of Wemby after a year in the league, add some bulk to him. Yeah. Uh, I think we are entering the era of Wemby uh, being a, you know, no brainer defensive player of the year candidate and winner uh, for the foreseeable future. But for right now, I'm going to give it to the guy who was the best defender on the best team defense, a historically great defense, and that was Rudy Gobert. Yeah. I'd bet my nose that Whoa. Wemby is going to break the depoy record. He's going to win at least five. That's right. If that doesn't Can happen, I hold you to that in 20 years? Can I hold you to that? You can take my nose. If that doesn't <laughs> I know you've always been jealous, and you can have it, but it's not going to happen. I do have Gobert here, though. And he's just the more refined defender at this stage. That's the thing with Wemby. Nobody else has his sheer potential for, like, jaw-dropping disruption, right? The how the hell did he do that sort of play. But I think something that we can miss with defense is that sometimes it is just more valuable to be positionally perfect and to be an elite deterrent without chasing the big plays every time. Often times defenders reach their peaks not necessarily when they are at their peak block totals and I think that that is a difference between Gobert and Wemby. Wemby makes these unbelievable plays that nobody else can just because of his physical tools and overall that is a huge net positive and it's a reason that Wemby is a top three defender on the planet but he also chases some of those plays that are literally impossible to the detriment of the team defense because then he puts himself out of position and uh, he allows an easy offensive rebound that was something that I highlighted in the most recent matchup against the Nuggets Wemby taking himself out of position chasing these like unbelievable highlight plays if he could have made them but you don't And you can say, well, he has to do all sorts of incredible things on the back end to make up for his lackluster teammates. And that's fair. He does consistently. But also, chasing an impossible play is never a good thing to me. There are ways to affect people, to use your length, and to be perfectly in position to alter their shot, to make them reconsider things without taking yourself out of position. And Wemby does that a lot, too. But, 
Gobert is so consistently disciplined. He's so fundamentally sound. And he still has overwhelming physical tools. He's not Wemby, but he's 7'1 with a 7'9 wingspan. Like, his wingspan was a record setter, I think, when he entered the league in terms of as long as it had been officially measured at the Combine. And I do think he is still the slightly better pure uh, interior defender. People shoot 53% against Wemby at the rim, which is an awesome mark. They shoot 49% against Gobert. You mentioned the physical maturity. I do think that that manifests itself in post defense. Like most of the time, if you go at Wemby, you may think, oh, I have a weight advantage. I have a strength advantage, but he is so absurdly long. I always think about like Clint Capella damn near had a dunk in the rim. Like he bullied Wemby to one foot away from the bucket and Wemby still blocked it. Like he can erase those advantages, but Gobert has insane length with uh, an incredible IQ with just a much stronger frame. That's why he's an elite post defender, 90th percentile. Wemby is hovering around the 53rd percentile. I think people tend to understate how solid Gobert is guarding in space. He's over 80th percentile as a spot up and ISO defender this year. And he is driving by far the best defense in the league. As I've said a couple times, the biggest gap in defensive rating between the number one defense and the number two defense that we have seen in 30 years. And that does matter to me. What Wemby's done is incredible, taking this defense that would very obviously be uh, towards the absolute bottom of the league, and they play as a 78th percentile defense with him on the floor. They post a defensive rating equivalent to the fifth, fifth best in the league. Like, that is incredible. But I do value anchoring these elite defenses. That's always basically been a fundamental requirement for the award. And people are acting like Gobert couldn't, do this but it's like guys do you understand that gobert was churning out number one defenses number one in the league with poor perimeter defense in utah with no secondary rim protection like people love to hate rudy gobert and i get the frustrations not a likable guy it just in terms of personality not a likable guy and let's face it, a lot of people in this country hold contempt for the French. And I think that Wemby is doing wonders to overcome that. But nobody likes the unskilled offensive big. Nobody likes the guy who it feels like will get punked because he can't score on the little guy consistently. We've seen those moments from Gobert. But it just doesn't take away from the fact that he's a generational defender. And particularly in the regular season, just like basically the perfect defensive anchor. And if you took him out of the equation, like, yeah the Timberwolves would still have really good perimeter defenders, but they would not be nearly the all-time force that they have been on that end of the floor this season. So if you want to take Wemby because of the defensive playmaking, because of the unparalleled range, like I can see the case. He's absolutely disgusting, but I'm still going go bear here. Okay, let's talk about sixth man of the year, Logan. Who's your choice there? Uh, your darling boy, Malik Monk. Let's go. Uh, I think this is... This is a good race. This is a really good race uh, between two other guys I considered. Uh, Nas Reed, for one, uh, one of the most skilled just big men in the league today. The the versatility that he provides Minnesota is so valuable, too, being a guy who can run the four or the five, a guy who's not a defensive liability, you know, who can competently defend in space and protect the rim and crash the glass. And then offensively, being able to initiate from the perimeter, being able to knock down shots. I mean, I want to say I looked at his shot chart the other day, and he was, and maybe this was just, yeah, this was just over the stretch when Cat was out. Nas Reed was over 40% from every spot behind the arc, corner wings and top of the Tough. key. Like, he is an exceptional shooter. And, I mean, how can you not love him, man? It's Nas Reed, dude. He's America's baby boy. He's the anti Gobert and he's the anti Cat, bro. Everybody hates the two like flagship T Wolves bigs, but everybody <laughs> loves the third guy. I mean, how can you not? How can you not love Nas Reed? My uh, friend of the show, Michael Donahue, always says to uh, our third center is better than your starting center, and in a lot of cases, it's true. It's hard um, picking against a guy this skilled. Another guy that was hard to pick against was Bobby Portis, and I love and appreciate Bobby Portis and his game so much. Uh, one of my roommates loves to hate on Bobby Portis. I think it's because Bobby's got those crazy eyes. Mm, and uh, he does. And that, I don't know, Bobby plays an unconventional style of basketball, but there's beauty in it to me, man. The post fades, the turnarounds, the silky smooth, buttery mid-range game. The He's a good shooter from behind the arc, too, man. When Bobby Portis gets in a rhythm, 
like he can rattle off like three or four threes and it's just like if you guys aren't going to d him up he is going to spray from behind the arc Mm -hmm. good defender good rebounder good decision maker just a really valuable guy to have off the bench so if those are either of your two picks uh I have no issue with it, but to me, it's Malik Monk because Malik Monk has the most valuable skill set out of those three guys. I think you can find replacement level bigs who don't do exceptional things like Portis or Nas Reed. Like, they're anomalies in the sense that they are really skilled for big guys, that they can knock down shots like that. But I just think there's a depth of bigs in the league where you can go out and get an impactful five man. Guys are hard to find in the mold of Malik Monk. Guys who are really good operators out of the pick and roll. Guys who can float your offense when your star creator isn't out there. Guys who can just relentlessly get downhill and attack the rim and create rim pressure. Guys who can stop and knock down crazy pull-up jump shooter or uh, pull-up jump shots. Guys who can get hot in the game and swing a game when their shot is on and just drop a 30-piece off the bench. Like... Uh, that's the distinction and the differentiator I would make between Reed, Portis, all these other bench guys. Malik Monk, to me, just has the most valuable mold uh, of six-man and bench creator archetype, and I think he's the best in the league today doing it. Uh, great playmaker at this stage in his career, um, and just a lot more consistent than his early years. Uh, so, for me, it is your your darling boy, Carson, your favorite, uh, Mr. Malik Monk. I'm taking Malik as well, but I will say, let's not insinuate that Nas Reed is in any way replaceable. That in-and-out dribble is not replaceable, man. And I really love Bobby. I think it is fun to see a guy who has a super versatile scoring game in terms of, you mentioned, uh, attacking with physicality out of the post, getting to his hooks, utilizing all three levels. I've always been a Bobby Portis guy, but what sets Malik apart to me, and the reason he's one of the stronger Six Man of the Year winners in recent years is normally we give six man of the year to basically who is tough bucket, probably inefficient, probably doesn't do anything else, no playmaking, but they just put up a decent amount of points. Malik has a uniquely well-rounded skill set. Like no disrespect, but compared to the Jordan Clarksons or uh, people will think this is blasphemous. The Jamal Crawford's guys, Jamal Crawford's highlight tape is a lot cooler than he actually was effective as a basketball player is his ability to facilitate. Like Malik is an awesome passer, great synergy with bigs out of pick and roll, good pocket passer, awesome wraparound passer on drives, creating looks for shooters. And then he's also this high end athlete, super quick first step who has these hot stretches as a pull up shooter, as a shooter off the catch. To me, it really is about that playmaking dimension, though. There's a lot of dudes who, if you just give them enough touches, they can score in a vacuum, and maybe the efficiency isn't great. And it's not even great for Malik. It's okay. It's solid. But the ability to elevate teammates, to weaponize the attention that you draw, like that's what makes great players. You have to do it at another level still from where Malik is at, but he is definitely one of, if not the best playmaking sixth man winners that we've seen since Manu is like an exception. Lou Will got better in his older years, but still I think that Malik is definitely a better playmaker. So he is my choice, but shout out to Nas Reed, shout out to Bobby. Some of the other guys, it's like there's no case for Norman Powell over Malik because, yeah, Norman Powell can light it up as a scorer, but that man does not really like to pass the ball. Okay, how about most improved, Logan? This has been an interesting race all year. Who did you end up going with? I'm going to go with my guy, Kobe White, and this one was tough. Uh, a nerd sesh favorite, man, Jalen Johnson, has balled out this year. I think he is such a good... So good. Just connecting piece, man. And I want the Hawks to figure it out so bad just because, like, it... I don't know, man. The Atlanta Hawks don't make any sense to me, dude. Like, they bum me out. They, yeah, they, they make me mad. I, they just have so many, like, talented players that I really like, and just, yet yeah, they just... Like, man, they got Kobe Bufkin, they got Onyeko Kongwu, they got DeAndre Hunter, they got A.J. Griffin. They, I could go on and on, man. They have so many talented individual basketball players, and it just doesn't work. They got a great head coach. I don't know what's going on in Atlanta. Jalen Johnson has a real case here. Um, you know, I know some people would probably go Alperin Sengun. They'd go Tyrese Maxey because they think they hit that, you know, star level. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, it's Kobe just because, one, you know, I, I thought Kobe was – kind of a finished product like last year like I didn't think that 
I didn't see a higher ceiling for Kobe. You know, the Bulls mm-hmm. had pushed him to the end of the rotation. They weren't giving him burn. He was averaging sub 10 points per game. And then Zach Levine gets hurt, and Kobe steps up. And not only steps up minutes in production, like he's leading to good offense. Um, I, I did a video on Kobe earlier in the year, and I noted he was the best spot-up scorer in the league. I mean, he is a special spot-up player. And the primary reason is because Kobe White is an elite shooter of the basketball. He shot 41% on pull-up threes this year. Uh, He shot, this is a very small sample size, only 18 shots. Carson, he shot 56% on three-pointers between 30 and 34 feet. 30 plus footers. That's, yes, uh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Calculator over here, Carson Brever. Uh, well, it's actually 55.5 repeating is what you don't want them to know. That's exactly what I don't want them to know. I round it up. <laughs> we round up here at Nerd Sesh sometimes. Freaking Carson, man. He shot 38% on threes, 25 to 29 feet. Um, and, I mean, he's just he's really well-rounded. When you're that elite of a shooter, it opens up everything else on the basketball court for you, where if you're off uh, you know, playing spot up, playing second fiddle, boom. I'm either pulling it or I'm getting into the lane with an easy closeout. Um, and Kobe had some really special moments this year. I think it was, yeah, I kind of, I tried to erase it from my brain. Uh, the game against Sacramento when the Kings had a massive lead and then Kobe just goes berserk in the fourth quarter. Uh, I think lights us up for like a 35 or a 40 piece that game. Uh, Bulls steal that one. And this is a Bulls team that was, in my opinion, really like devoid of hope after Levine uh, got hurt, bad stretches, and it didn't matter, man. Kobe led to great offense. He averaged five boards, five assists, two. He's just a guy who I think is going to lead to winning offense no matter what spot you have him in. Is your lead ball handler, is your secondary ball handler, is your third guy. He's a super valuable weapon to have. Um, And yeah, I mean, coming from where he was last year where I thought, man, next year Kobe might fall out of the rotation completely, Maybe he's a guy that you just relegate to backup point guard minutes. You relegate to like a seventh or eighth guy. Kobe White's a starter. Kobe White is great, um, and I hope that he can improve even more. But he's a special shooter of the basketball. He's a special spot-up player, and he's a really well-rounded offensive player. They were six points per 100 possessions better with Kobe on the floor, uh, an offensive rating difference of 116.5 and Uh, 110.7. That's one of the biggest discrepancies uh, in the league, and this is a guy that yeah, just makes winning plays on or off ball, man. Kobe's one of my favorite guys in the league, and uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to give him most improved. Kobe White is a very good choice. Basically doubled his assist and scoring production from last year and has grown in a lot of ways. Like, always been a hell of a pure shooter, but the playmaking growth has really impressed me this year. And since December 1st, obviously, his offensive involvement increased after Levine was hurt, but he's giving you 21-5 and nearly 6. Just been very productive and helped float the ship for a Chicago team that needed it to remain competitive. I think Maxi's probably going to win this award, and I get it because the leap from really good player, quality third option, to clear all-star, some people might argue all-NBA level guy, is super valuable and it's something that we've rewarded in recent years. I just think we did see a little bit once Embiid was off the floor that Maxi was a beneficiary of increased volume. And I certainly think he's improved as a player and as a playmaker in particular, but he was already so damn good. It's kind of like, yeah, if you make him your lead perimeter option, if you just give him that volume, it's not that surprising that he can walk into 25 points and six, seven assists a night. My choice is still Jalen Johnson, Logan, and this isn't going to happen. Momentum on this is non-existent, but I think about Kobe going from, like you said, a guy who I had kind of lost hope on, who I thought, okay, this is just a rotation level player. This isn't a guy who's going to be a top three option on your team offensively. So impressive that he turned that around. But Jalen Johnson was end of the bench guy last year. Jalen Johnson was give you 12, 15 minutes a night scoring five points per game. And he has been so damn impressive this year and is just such a multifaceted winning player. And maybe that's what it comes down to. When I look at the sustainability of the improvement, it's like, 
I want Jalen Johnson on my team no matter who I am. And I think this is a guy who in transition is a lethal athlete. He's a hell of a positional rebounder. He's improved dramatically as a shooter up to 36% from deep on good volume this year. Incredibly instinctual playmaker and good ball handler for his size. Versatile plus defender. The production has skyrocketed this year. The efficiency has improved and is above average. So I love Jalen Johnson. I think he is like the perfect third option on any team. And, uh, the improvement for both him and Kobe is drastic, but I could argue that his is even more significant just because of how small his role was last year. Like Kobe, it felt like was kind of set in stone, but you still knew he was going to play his 20 something minutes a night. Jalen Johnson, again, was like uh, an end of the bench kind of guy an end of the rotation. And so I'm leaning him, but I really don't have strong feelings. If you want to take Kobe or if you want to take Maxi, it kind of depends on what type of improvement you want to reward this year. All of these guys make good cases. And then there's Shangun and there's Scotty Barnes. There's other guys who have taken sort of that leap from really good young player into uh, just all-star level guy. Okay, who is your coach of the year, Logan? I went back and forth on this one a lot. I'm going to go with the guy I picked at the midseason, Mark, and that's Mark Dagnalt, uh, mostly just because Oklahoma City is so far ahead of schedule. Um I did not expect a team this young to be this engaged defensively, um, to to be this dominant. I mean, to win 55-plus games is ridiculous for a team this young. And I just want to applaud him for steering the ship and gearing these guys up ready to play every night, man. The Thunder don't lack an effort. Uh, they never lack an energy. This team is always well-prepared, well-coached, ready to go. They are uber-talented, and that's where I... I consider going with a couple other guys. The other two guys I really heavily considered, uh, one was Tom Thibodeau. Uh, I just think, again, the constant energy and effort that you could get from the Knicks, regardless of night, opponent, whatever, you know, the Knicks are going to play hard. Uh, and I really like Tibbs. I, I, Tibbs is a really good coach. And the other guy I considered was Ime Udoka. Um, just for, from where expectations at the start of the season – you know, I knew Houston had building blocks that I liked. Uh, Amen Thompson, Sengun, um, you know, Jabari Smith Jr., uh, Jalen Green. You know, I, I thought we'd see marginal improvement, but I, in all seriousness, I thought Udoka was stepping into such a bad situation he was given. I, I thought the Rockets were going to win somewhere between 20 and 30 games. And so the fact that they were, you know, the last team out of the play-in in in a deep West— was impressive, but I ultimately decided that even though they exceeded my expectations probably about by about 15 wins, um, I didn't want to reward like mediocrity and not crashing the playoff party. If the Rockets had gotten into the play-in, I think I might have given mm -hmm. this to you to Udoka, but uh, I wanted to reward a guy who won overachieved, but did it with such a young squad and they're just so ahead of schedule. And it's hard. I, I want to emphasize that. Like, remember Steven Silas? That's why I'm so impressed with Dagnalt and Udoka mm -hmm. both. When Steven Silas coached that team, it is so hard to get a group of young guys to commit to making winning plays, to yeah. giving that constant defensive energy and effort every night. And for Udoka to do it with, with the Rockets was really impressive. But for Dagnalt, and this isn't a just this year thing where, oh, Chet Holmgren steps in and we lock in. Dagnalt has consistently regardless of if his stars are out there or not, has consistently gotten this team to outperform expectations and to just give that energy and effort on a nightly basis. And they were great this year. Uh, I was not, I was anticipating Oklahoma City being good, not anticipating them being this great already. And so uh, I give a ton of props to Dagnalt for, uh, for his role in coaching this team up. He was my pick preseason. I think he was your pick preseason. Pretty rare that you call the coach of the year. It feels like one of those awards where you just never know, and it's probably going to be like the person who overachieves expectations by the most. But I do think he's a really, really good basketball coach, man. I think he's creative offensively. I think it's incredibly rare to get defensive buy-in and results from a team this young, even if you have really good athletes and if you have smart, motivated young guys like to bring that all together to get the most out of it night after night after night and their effort night to night is just exceptional and that's why these thunder teams like last year were so competitive when you didn't have chet yet and you didn't have this version of j-dub and 
that team just didn't have as much talent. You didn't have Case on yet, but they were still a, a, a tough night, a tough team to face on any regular season night because they were going to play so hard. And I also think the player development here, you have your star, highly touted guys, right? Like Chet, obviously. Giddy is the next highest picked guy who honestly hasn't really panned out. And then J-Dub and uh, Shea were both just outside the top 10, but still they're considered premier talents or whatever. But when you're just talking about the diamonds in the rough, like Isaiah Joe has been so good for them. Aaron Wiggins has been so good for them. These sort of second round talents. And bottom line, winning 55 games when your top seven players are 25 or younger doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen in the NBA. And so it's an exceptional accomplishment. They are loaded with talent, but I do think that Dagnall is really good as well. And I agree with some of the other shout outs. I would give some props to Chris Finch just for how exceptional the T-Wolves have been defensively. Although I think a lot of that is due to personnel, but them grinding out an elite regular season, even with cat hurt down the stretch Tibbs, Again, it's like the constant balance of player versus coach where Brunson has just been superhuman and OG has changed their defense and whatnot. But he definitely has this team bought in and playing really good collective basketball. Jamal Mosley, again, you want to talk about getting a young team to play exceptional defense. That's a hard-ass thing to do. And he has Orlando doing that. So those would be my honorable mentions. But I'm going to go with Dagnall. Oh, actually, I'm going to change to Doc Rivers. I'm going to go Doc. Also, I'm going to hey, go uh... Doc and Darvin Ham. Wow. One more guy yeah. I want to give a shout out to is uh, Willie Green too, man. I like Willie Green a lot. I think he's, uh, I, I mean, I, I think the Pelicans achieved right where they should. No one reward a guy who kind of went above and beyond, but I like Willie Green too. Jamal Mosley's a really good shout. He should be on the, on the short list too. Um, yeah, dude, why don't we give it to, uh, <laughs> why don't we give it to Adrian Griffin, man? Yeah, let's give it to Adrian Griffin. I mean, why not? Him and Doc can share it. What an unbelievable job they've done. So last award, Logan, the new one, my least favorite, but maybe that's just because I'm attached to the old ways. Clutch player of the year. Who was your choice? Man, I didn't even write this down. Perfect. Just Fake go award. off of vibes then. Vibes. Probably the entire collective of the Phoenix Suns. I, I, oh, funny guy. Luka Doncic. I'll give it to Luka. Oh, interesting. I think Steph is probably going to win just because like his specific clutch production has been really good he and DeRozan are the leading clutch scorers but Steph's efficiency is pretty ridiculous 47 percent from three even though the Warriors have like some a brutal meltdown losses this year very little of that actually falls on Steph so I think that he's my choice here but I don't really care about this award it is kind of a fake award the NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up by betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. And North Carolina listeners, don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code NERDS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. That's only a DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. We're into all NBA, Logan. And uh, for this one, we just have to focus on where we disagree. We'll only focus on the standouts or else we'll go on forever. Because first team, I think there's four clear locks. Luka, SGA, Jokic, Giannis. You agree, I presume. My fifth spot is going to Jason Tatum. Who is in your fifth spot? My fifth spot is also going to Jason Tatum. And I, I want to be clear about all my awards, too. All NBA, uh, all defense, and all rookie are all positionless now, right? All positionless now. First year that that's been the for, case for all NBA and all defense. For the sake of my brain and for the sake of lineup continuity, even though it has nothing to do with this, uh, I, I just kind of went with the standard. I went three backcourt, or excuse me, I went three front court guys and two backcourt guys okay. for basically all of my lineups. Cause okay. Stuck in the past. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just it just makes a little more sense like that to me. But you appreciate the freedom to go position. I do, I do. I, I like it. I enjoy it. Yes. And if there I'm was somebody to change, yeah. And if there was somebody that was like so overwhelming, I would you know I would give them the ben Like if I really thought that Jalen Brunson had you know a way better case than Tatum for that fifth spot, I would have given it to Brunson. But I, I gave it to Tatum. Yeah, man. 
I'm just over the years of uh, DeAndre Jordan as first team center and Marc Gasol and Joe Kim Noah. No disrespect. I love Noah and Gasol, but I think for the most part, positional rigidity has just been a bad thing. Like positional talent does fluctuate by position group. And also not to be cliche, but like it is a relatively positionless game at this point. There's not a lot of people you go small forward, power forward. No, you're probably talking in archetypes of wings, bigs, primary ball handlers, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason I gave it to Tatum, it feels like the competition at this point is Brunson just because he's made such a strong push. But over the totality of the year, I think having a guy give you 27, 8, and 5 on better than 60% true shooting as a really high-end defender on a team that is 57 and 16 when he plays kind of has to be rewarded. I do believe that he is the better overall basketball player than Brunson. Now, could he do what Brunson is doing in this stretch offensively? He could not, I don't think. But... It is about the totality of rebounding and defense, and he's still been a hell of an offensive player this year. Like, the defensive gap outweighs the offensive gap to me. If Brunson had been doing this all year at this volume and efficiency, that'd be a different story. But he fits nicely onto my second team, along with Logan, Book, Kawhi, AD, and KD. Second team was really tough for me. I think I know what you're wooing at there, but there could be two guys because really I felt like there were seven dudes who I wanted to put on my second team. So who is your group here? I completely agree with you on a lot of this. I went Brunson, D-Book, Kawhi, AD, and LeBron uh, was mm. my other one. So uh, I, I did consider I, that was a last-minute change I made. I debated between KD and LeBron. Um, and I also debated... I don't know if he's on your third team or not. I debated Wemby versus AD as well. That was a real conversation wow. to me. You um, sick bastard. But, I mean, I just think Anthony Davis is the better player, so I gave it to AD. It also was tough because, I honestly, I didn't want to have two Lakers or two Suns on my second team because they were For both sure. playing. <laughs> yeah, and I had that same dilemma. Ultimately, the reason that I went KD is not because I think he's a better player than LeBron. I don't. He's not the guy who I would want more in a single game environment, nor is he the guy who has had the higher peaks this season. It's basically just that he's tried harder, and especially on the defensive side of the floor has been Katie more got the try hard effort. award. Well, he's still Kevin Durant. He's still giving you 27, 7, and 5 on 63% true yeah. shooting. But I've seen some people be like, LeBron shouldn't even be all NBA. And I'm like, dude, what? Like, LeBron is so damn good. I just made the video on how this version of him is so terrifying. Post-All-Star break, LeBron is over 27 points and 9 assists per game on 67% true shooting, bro. LeBron shooting like this is absolutely terrifying, and the Lakers' offense has been awesome in that stretch. So, I was conflicted about this, but it, it came down basically to night-to-night -night effort when you're talking about two players who overall are still like pretty close in terms of their peak effectiveness, although I would lean LeBron. And then I went 80 over LeBron just because I think the burden that he carries defensively every single night offsets the offensive advantage that LeBron has. And you took Book over KD for second team. Do you care to elaborate on the thought process behind that? Because I think some people might be a little bit surprised. That one was more of a toss-up for me, too. Uh, I went LeBron over KD just because I went with... Normally in these situations, I just go with the guy I would rather have. I'd rather have LeBron. I think mm -hmm. you make a great point about effort. I mean, if I factored that in, it definitely would be KD. Uh, KD over Book is interesting to me. That one was tough. I just think Book's the better offensive engine at this point in his career. I'd rather put the ball in his hands, have him dictate and make decisions playmaking-wise. And I want to give a lot of credit to KD, too. I mean, KD's gotten better in that regard, and he's a legitimately good playmaker. Mm -hmm. He has his unstoppable shots. Uh, to me, I just would rather have the, the guy with the more diverse shot palette, the guy who creates more downhill rim pressure, even though they are very, very similar. I just think Booker is the marginally better player that one was probably the toughest decision though i agree and when i was thinking about okay if i am only going to have one son on second team who would it be it was book for me i think because of the playmaking edge sons are five and two with him and without kd they're six and eight when those roles are reversed and 
because of his physicality, the diversity of his shot palette and his playmaking, I lean book. And God, dude, I might flip on this LeBron KD thing. Like LeBron post all-star break offensively has just been absurd. I'm flipping. I'm flipping on the KD LeBron thing. I just think LeBron at his best moments has been clearly better. And uh, I am therefore making the reverse argument of what I just said, but it just doesn't feel right to me. LeBron is just better at this stage than KD. And we can be like, oh, but the Suns are the better team. It's like, well, they're separated by two games. LeBron's on off number is a good bit higher. He has been super impactful. The Lakers have just been dragged down by these weird bad lineups and KD's been awful in the clutch. I'm flipping. Now we're at third team. We've got Steph for me, Ant, KD now has been demoted, and these last two spots are where it gets really interesting. I have Paul George and Victor Wembanyama here, Logan. I love the PG show, man. Paul George has been playing such exceptional basketball. The two toughest guys to cut off this list for me, by far. I wanted to get my guy De'Aaron Fox on here so badly. I also so badly wanted to get Paul George on this list. My third team, Steph Curry, Anthony Edwards, Kevin Durant, Victor Wembanyama, and my last spot went to Zion Williamson. Ooh, interesting. So I considered Zion. The reason I went with PG is I do think you've seen a more pronounced two-way impact from him this year, and I also think... Just the uh, overall impact because of his offensive versatility and efficiency has been pretty massive this year. I do want to say real quick, we did a show with Jason today that may or may not be up when you listen to this, and we were praising PG, but then you and Jason kept saying, oh, this might be the best PG we've ever seen, and I kept on thinking, fellas, 2019 MVPG, just better to me, just better athlete, more imposing rim pressure and finisher, but PG has been playing awesome. It's the most efficient version of him that we've seen. And his ability to fit alongside two other on-ball creators like Harden and Kawhi is really impressive. Like his movement off-ball, his shooting off-ball and off-movement, but then also still being this really high-end on-ball creator. I think he's just had a great year and I think a little bit better than Zion. Ant, Steph, are locks at least for third team. If you wanted to argue Steph for second team, I would totally hear it. Just because it's like, if you're going to have two Suns or two Lakers when they've only been marginally more successful than Steph, who is like clearly the lone superstar on his team, something about that does feel a little bit strange. But I just think with his decreased impact as a playmaker this year, with more erratic scoring, less rim pressure, less efficient scoring overall, it just hasn't been the most impactful Steph that we've seen. And so... Uh, I have him on third team. And then Ant, I get that the T-Wolves are great and he's like the face, but overall the T-Wolves are great because of that all-time defense and Ant just, to me, still isn't of the caliber as a player of the guys who I have on my second team. Maybe with the exception of Brunson, but Brunson's just had a better season and has been on this flame-throwing stretch as of late. And that's what made Steph and Wemby so hard to figure out where they were going to go because you have to really isolate them from their situation. Steph's situation is so brutally tough as the only creator. Wemby is the only good basketball player on the Spurs. Real. I don't, I don't, I don't mean that, but like... Real. In terms of like, you know, really good basketball players, it's literally Wemby versus the world. Um, Zion Williamson, uh, I gave him the nod just because I think Zion has really improved you know, as a playmaker, as a ball handler from the perimeter. Uh, and just, he's one of the most impactful downhill forces, like, in the league. It's absurd. Like, his first step, how high he gets up, how he's able to absorb contact. Science, awesome. And I hear an argument for PG's um, like two-way impact being more valuable. Uh, the one thing that I would say, and again, that's what makes picking these teams so hard, is it's like, he's also got Kawhi to lean on. And he had Harden, and I think the Clippers are a better team. And, you know, the Pelicans, they also have Brandon Ingram and a great team defense collective around Zion. So, you know, that's what's really hard to, to you know, choose between. I just think Zion is poses such a physical imposition on the game. He's just so hard to stop and such a matchup nightmare on a nightly basis. One thing that surprised me looking at Zion's numbers, Carson, 
Guess how many three pointers Zion took this year? Mm, 20. 68 games played. He took 15. You know, that's really, and when you're this impactful as a downhill rim pressure and just unstoppable at getting to the paint, you know, you ask the question, it's like, well, you know, why would you? But, you know, I think obviously the next step for Zion or, you know, the final evolution for him if he gets there would be, you know, expanding to that mid range, expanding as a three point shooter. But I would have helped, he, I would have hoped he would have been further along, but he's so dominant and so great at what he's good at. Um, you know, it almost negates it. But I think Zion made real strides this year, you know, as a primary ball handler, as a playmaker. And it's such a physical force. I just wanted to reward that. But I wanted to get Foxy on here, man. I wanted to get Paul George. The league is just so damn talented now. Um, I wanted to get Chet Holmgren on here too somehow, man, like in just terms of impact. That would have been a bit of a stretch, I think. Uh, Shout out Jalen Brown. Shout out Porzingis. Uh, Fox and Paul George were the two toughest cuts for me, though. Another painful one for me was Halley, just because he so clearly would have been here if he stayed healthy. And still, over the course of the year, it's like, led the Pacers to be a 96th percentile offense with him out there, averaged 20 on 11 on 61% true shooting. But it's like, for half the year, he just wasn't the guy that we were accustomed to. 17 and 9 on 57% true shooting over his last 34 games, obviously, because of the hamstring injury. So I ended up leaving him just off. I think we might need to explain this Wemby selection, Logan. I'm surprised that you have him. I uh, did not expect to have Wemby on my team. But when I thought about the competing cases, it just came down to the fact that for basically three quarters of this year, I think Wemby's been better than all of the other names I considered. Now, that is the challenge because for the first quarter of the year, I'm like, he probably wasn't the best rookie. And that says more about Chet just being exceptional, but it also speaks to Wemby uh, really figuring things out offensively at that point. And of course, he was not helped by his offensive situation, but the efficiency was really quite rough. He wasn't having as overwhelmingly monstrous a defensive impact, although he was still obviously a super high impact defender. But just the level that he's been at for several months now, the playmaking, the overwhelming physical advantages as a rim finisher, what he has done with his perimeter skill, even if it's not the most efficient, like the ability to carry that load at all, to run inverted pick and roll with solid efficiency, to be as good a pull-up shooter as he's been. And even though it's like, okay, he's giving you 21 a night, but it's on a bad team and the turnovers are high and the efficiency is slightly below league average. But then I thought, People will consider Gobert here just because of what he's doing defensively. And if Wemby is giving me, let's say, 95% of what Gobert is defensively, but then is able to carry a legit star load offensively, even if it's imperfect and on a bad team, but just like the ability to do that at all, to create those shots, it's special. And Sabonis is probably the guy who most people will have here because of the production and efficiency And I get it. I also just don't think DeMontis Sabonis is the most impactful basketball player. There's a reason to me that throughout his career, his teams are like, I want to say maybe half a point per 100 possessions better with him on the floor than off it. And this year, they've been a few points worse. Like to me, he just doesn't transform the game in a way that Wemby does because of obviously a massive gap in defensive impact. And then of course the bonus is playmaking and efficient scoring is super valuable, but I do think to some extent he takes the easy stuff. And obviously we know that like a large part of his role in that offense is just basic facilitating as a big out of handoffs and whatnot. And all that stuff is super valuable, but what Wemby has done just being this world-breaking defensive player while still being a damn good offensive player, he's just at this level. Like, he's a top 15-ish player in the league, and he's been there for long enough to where I think he belongs. And when you consider some of the guys who aren't eligible because of health, I kind of think he's the next man up. Yeah, I mean, obviously Embiid would be here, and the other guys I considered, uh, Bam, uh Sabonis obviously uh you know I name dropped Chet I think Chet's on like the you know the short list off but that was the difference or Gobert too and that was the difference for me I was like well if I'm gonna put a purely defensive big on this list do I want Gobert or Bam or Victor well I'm gonna take Victor 
Mm-hmm. And then I looked at it offensively, and I'm like, if I'm going to put an offensively inclined big, it's going to be Sabonis. And I just think Wemby's better. Again, it's important to attempt as best we can to isolate the player from their environment. And mm-hmm. I do the simple mind brain exercise of, well, if I dropped Wemby into this situation, is this a better team? Yes. Yeah. I think the Kings are a much better team with that. I think Wemby is so – he's already one of the most offensively skilled bigs in the league one season into his career – and he's also one of the most impactful defensive bigs. So for me, it was a, it wasn't a no-brainer. Like I considered other guys, but I asked myself, what center do I want most out of this next crop of guys? It's Wemby. Mm-hmm. The question is really just, has he done it for long enough over the course of this season? Because he wasn't an all-star, so it really is about the second half of the year, but it's also since early December. Like, of course, he's gotten better throughout there, but I read off how ridiculous the numbers are. I feel comfortable having him here. I just think he's better than the other guys who we're considering, and I think he's been at this level for long enough to where he justifies that third-team spot. You definitely can't put him higher. Definitely can't put him second team. Then we're just talking about the proven superstar class. He's my 15th guy on uh, my All-NBA teams, but... I think he's earned it. All right, let's talk all defense, Logan. So I'm interested in how your positional rigidity impacts things here because I have some wonky uh, positional combinations. I just went with the five guys who I think are the best. So my first team is Wemby, Gobert, AD, Bam, and Herb Jones. What's your first team? It's such a funny lineup, man. I got the four big look. Like I said, if I had done this with the position list, like the new rules – I'd probably have eight of my 10 spots be big men. Mm. I just don't want to do that. I want to reward the perimeter defenders as well as rewarding the best big. So I'm sorry. If you're not one of the four best defensive bigs, you're not going to crack my list. And that omits a lot of great defensive big men here, like uh, Evan Mobley, Chet Holmgren, both of those guys, I think two of the best defenders in the NBA, did not make my list because I want it to be somewhat resembling uh, an actual basketball lineup. So my first team, uh, Jalen Suggs, Drew Holiday, Jaden McDaniels, Victor Wembanyama, and Rudy Gobert. Okay. So, interestingly, I don't have more bigs on this list. I actually have all of my bigs who are on my (laughs) defense teams at all on my first team. And the reason is I just think these four are a class above. I think Mm -hmm. Wemby, Gobert, AD, and Bam – all of them with their distinct superstar game-breaking traits. And then I do think that Herb has been just unbelievable. I mean, his matchup versatility, his hands, his playmaking instincts, his length, like the dude has been a star. But my second team is all perimeter defenders. So interesting, but at the same time, it's just like, is there any question that when you consider the eligible guys, because Draymond Mm -hmm. wasn't eligible, that the four best defenders on the planet, in some order, are Gobert, AD, Wemby, and Bam. Like, those are the four guys, right? And so then after Mm -hmm. that, I considered various guys in terms of bigs. Chet Holmgren, I ultimately decided that his deficiencies as a rebounder kept him off. And uh, I still think he's a solid post defender, but he's not one of the league's best because of his slightness. KP, I consider just because his sheer rim protection has been so great, but I decided ultimately... His lack of being a high-end defender in space or a real plus rebounder kept him off. So I ended up going with uh, Jalen Suggs, Alex Caruso, Drew Holiday, Jaden McDaniels, and Derek White as my second team. Wow. I, I mean, I, I, did we get the exact same 10? My second team is Derek, the same Derek White, Alex Caruso, Herb Jones, Anthony Davis, Bam Adebayo. Perfect. So um, uh, wait, my, did you my, have Drew first team? Yeah, I did have Drew first. Oh, game. I like that. I like um, that. I uh, my two closest omissions. You shouted out, you know, Porzingis, Holmgren, Mobley. They were close for me. And again, I don't think Mobley was eligible. Um, Mobley's not eligible. Didn't Draymond wasn't case. eligible. And the guy that I think would have had the closest case. I don't know if I would have gotten him here if he played enough games. OG Ananobi was by far the closest 100% cut for me. Would have been here like, for me. OG would have been first team for me. He yeah. would have booted Herb. All I mean, respect he's, to Herb. He's been insane. It's so impactful. And just like how – he's huge. It is ridiculous. Like, 
I don't think I, I don't know if I just didn't watch enough Toronto Raptors games. I don't know if it's the blue that the Knicks wear. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Like when OG touches the rock or something, or I, it's kind of staggering. I, I like Bro OG's is in love. I mean, he's he's just a big dude, man. Yeah, or he is. Maybe it's because he's next to Brunson. I don't know. OG's a, a great defender, and uh, I wanted to get him here, just not enough games played. So that's crazy, man. I was not anticipating us like matching the same 10. Yeah, OG would 1,000% be here. I just don't know how you can overlook how completely he has transformed the Knicks defense. I said this on Jason's show today. They have a 100 defensive rating with him out there, and they're 18-3 and three when he plays. Like, just an absolute game-breaker. So strong, as you mentioned, so long. Excellent hands and instincts. Uh, can bring you some shot-blocking value. The guy is just incredible. And the other player who absolutely would be here if he met the requirement, Draymond, but then also Jonathan Isaac. Like, just what an absolute monster. But I guess just briefly to explain these, Caruso, I think, is the best, like, pure guard perimeter defender in basketball. Suggs, first of all, want to reward somebody from that Orlando defense for being so great, but that man is just an absolute hound. Motor doesn't stop, and he's... First of all, so quick laterally, but also so compact, so strong, and has those playmaking instincts. Drew has been so versatile in the roles he's filled this year, and at times has been in a Romer role, guarding bigs, uh, has brought some of that secondary rim protection value, has been a good rebounding guard. So I've been super impressed by him. Derek White alongside him, just an absolute freak. Uh, and another elite shot blocking guard, another guy who is stout and strong and really tough to move off his spots. And then Jane McDaniels, just ridiculous length and agility and really good size at the point of attack. So shout out to the perimeter defenders. I think all of those guys are more compelling to me than maybe just like a, a really good pure rim protector like Jared Allen, who props to him. But without the Cavs, defense has fallen off as of late too. He, his case gets docked a little bit by me. All right. All rookie team, Logan. I'll give you my first team. Wemby, Chet, Brandon Miller, of course. Jaime Jaquez. And the fifth spot is where I think we may differ. I give it to a men Thompson. Ooh. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I went uh, my boy Kaysan Wallace, Brandon Miller, Jaime Jaquez, okay. Chet Holmgren, and Victor Wembanyama. kason has been so, so solid. Just super efficient offensive player, great shooter, good playmaker, plus defender. I can't knock it. I've just been wowed by a man. Mm -hmm. Like, it's incredible to think about his trajectory because this guy was in the G League for a time this year, but for a significant majority of the season has been up with the big boys. And you just see, like, these special, special one-of-one, one, arguably, traits. I always say that, and then it's like Asar exists. But you know what? Amen is a little bit better at a few things, so he is one-of-one. One. Transition, you just can't stop the guy with a head of steam. As a cutter and as a threat in the dunker spot, he is so unbelievably explosive. He hasn't gotten to flash his full passing ability just because he isn't handling the ball like that, but you still see like what he can do as a connector. I mean, the guy is kind of a passing savant. And then defensively, He's a monster. He's 6'7", long as hell, absurd lateral quickness, unbelievable dog and length and instincts, like two stocks per game. His efficiency has been good for a rookie because he's such a great finisher around the rim. The Rockets have been slightly better with him on the floor, and he's done that on a legit solid team. So to me, he's like kind of blended the two different archetypes of an all-rookie guy, which is like, oh, wow, this guy is so talented, or oh, wow, this guy is more of a high floor contributing to a good team. A man, because he was on a competitive team doing like valuable little things, but then also is just this absolute freak athlete where you can see all the upside. I thought he blended those two nicely. So he was my last first team choice. I understand that. That's good justification. I went with Kaysan for kind of the similar reasons, maybe not as like flashy as a rookie, but you know, I had Kaysan really high on my board because mm -hmm. this is exactly what I expected. Like I just... His tape just said he was going to be a winning basketball player no matter where he went. The stuff he does on ball and off ball on uh, offensively as a ball handler, but he's also a great shooter. Defensively, he's an undersized guard, so he can get picked on a little bit, but he's a dog. Um, Kaysan's just a winner, and I wanted to reward that. Also, 
I don't know if we talked about this earlier in the year, dude. I cannot believe that Amen Thompson, Anasar Thompson's middle name is XLNC, bro. Like what? I didn't both, know that. Both of their middle names are XL, like Excellency, but XLNC, oh, like the letters. That's sick, bro. That's the Bay Area's finest. San Leandro's finest, bro. Shout out to the Thompson Twins. Yes. Yeah. Okay, second team. I have Pods, Derek Lively, Kason, Bilal Kulabali, mm. and Asar. One guy who I'm very pained to leave off here. I'm interested to see if you have him, but who's on your second team? I don't know what I'm going to do with this last spot. I went Brandon Podzemski, Amen Thompson, Asar Thompson, Derek Lively the second, and I am currently debating between Scoot Henderson, Keontae George, and my guy Gigi Jackson. Ooh, interesting. Or maybe None TJD. Of those guys... I don't know, man. Mm. I'm I'm really TJD. TJD is the guy who I really wanted to have on here because shout out Gigi. He has been a bucket in the latter half of this year. And uh, Scoot, up, you just see up. the talent. Like, obviously, he's ridiculously inefficient. But TJD is just doing such a good job of filling a role. And uh, in the latter half of the Dude, year, I think you could legit actually, argue has been better than Pods. I think I'm going to knock Scoot off. Dude, do you want to hear TJD's per 36 right now? Sure. 17, 11, and 3 on 70% from the field yeah. with two and a half blocks per game. Yeah, I think I'm going to boot Scoot for TJD. Now, the one thing I will say, Logan, there's a reason it's per 36, and that's ultimately why I left him off. Just over the course of the year, he has had uh, the smallest responsibilities of these guys. Like, he's played the fewest minutes, and he's also had – the simplest role mm -hmm. like lively also has a simple role but he was immediately asked to step in as a starter and change the dynamics for this Mavs team having a big of that size and length and athleticism but i just love tjd and uh, pods got off to this amazing start to the year and has been super valuable and like his playmaking his positional rebounding his shooting just a really good player but what tjd does athletically mm -hmm. as a rim protector like being any sort of athletic rim finishing big for the dubs he's so good he's so good but then i thought man can you imagine if asar thompson was on a real nba team you know what that's fair that's fair and it's just like this dude is an absolute freak athlete freak defensive talent of course he's not going to be efficient he's playing in detroit <laughs> and then koulibaly is one where it's like maybe he uh doesn't really have that name brand value but he's just been impressive this year mm -hmm. his playmaking his fluidity as a ball handler and shot maker has been more ahead of schedule than i expected he has the tools defensively and it's like if you put him in a capable situation i think he'd be a stud too so it is tough to strike that balance of put in a position to impact games just filling a role versus talented but in really bad basketball situations ultimately i decided TJD just hasn't quite had the like volume of playing time that he would need to be on here, but he's a tough gut because I love the guy. Oh. And he, uh, as of late, he's just been awesome and he has been really important. Yeah. I, I don't even really care about the like minutes thing, like just impact wise. And then I think about like the moments that I remember, like, you know, Koulibaly doesn't really have a moment. Keontae George Because he plays in Washington. I mean, and that's fair. That's a fair criticism. But, I mean, when I think of TJD, he's had a game where he stuffs Giannis three times. He's got all these alley-oops where he's just yamming on guys. Like He's 11 blocks over the last three games. He's a... Uh, I think and TJD... he's a good passer. Yeah, he might be in the simplest role, but I think he's just the most impactful winning player. So, I'm going to give it to him. If TJD had been playing as much as he has been over these last few weeks... No doubt he would be here, but he hasn't been at the end of the day. He's 16 minutes a night over the year, but I have no problem with you having TJD. I have no problem with anybody having TJD. Some other shout outs. You mentioned Scoot, Keontae, Cam Whitmore, Juwani Kamara had a really solid rookie year, Jordan Hawkins with his shooting. So mm -hmm. shout out to all of those guys. And Logan, we did it. We moved through this thing. I thought this episode was going to be three hours. Not bad. Mm-hmm. 
Not I bad. Thought, I thought we were definitely going for the two-hour pod today, man. For sure, dude. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. It's always fun to uh, reflect on the year and ultimately make these decisions. The All-NBA and All-Defense and uh, All-Rookie are where you can get the really agonizing ones. But hope this was fun for you guys. If you want more Nerd Sesh content, then there is plenty of it. I just did a video on LeBron, as I mentioned. That is on our YouTube channel, as are all of our full shows. We talked with Hoop Venue, who is awesome, about some of the contenders uh, just throughout the league where we may differ in our view of them. And then we had a similar conversation with Jason Timpf over at Hoops Tonight and also covered some other topics. So that all is probably up on his YouTube channel. I don't know exactly the timing. You can also check out our trivia stuff across all social media, TikTok, Instagram at NerdSesh, Twitter at Nerd underscore Sesh. You can check out our merch if you want. We got hats, we got shirts, we got hoodies. Logan is not wearing the Nerd Sesh hat for <laughs> once. What's wrong, buddy? I switched Why? up. I, I rocked it on Jason's show. I wanted to hit him with a mm. little curveball today. I mean, the black on black is a nice look, so can't hate on that. But all of that is at thevolume.com. You can also join our Discord if you want a chance to speak to the one, the only, Matthew Spawn Hour. And we uh, have Trivia Gauntlet returning, hopefully this weekend. We've already filmed it. And if you saw the O.J. Simpson poem on social, that is where that comes from. We just don't have the full episode ready yet. But that will be returning if you were wondering about that. So, with that, as always, appreciate you guys. Hope you enjoyed. I have been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash. Nerd Sash.